Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the second season of Your Last Best Hope for Conversation, your Babylon 5 podcast. We have made it through the first season, Yay. and today <laughs> we start our journey of the second season of Babylon 5. Someone right now is telling me what the name of the season is, and I'm drawing a blank on it. I'm sure that'll come up later, but we are talking points of departure as Captain John Sheridan, who assumes command of Babylon 5, he learns the reason why the Membari surrendered to Earth in the earth Membari War, while a renegade Membari ship seeks to restart it. This originally was first broadcast on November 2nd, 1994. Wow. As always, joining me on this journey is Lou. Hello, everyone. We are all coming to shadows. Yes. Uh. And the podcast bomb, Karen. Hello. It's the coming of shadows. Very right? nice. Yes, yep. it is. Dun, dun, dun. Shadows. Wow. Who are they? Mm. All right. So thank you, guys. We had a blast. If you this is your first episode with us, please go back and check all the other ones. Mm -hmm. We went through every episode in season one, discussing the good and the bad and the ugly. And after a quick little break, we are starting season two. So, Karen, I got to start with you because you have been on the record <laughs> that Bruce Boxleiter was your first celebrity crush. Yeah, as as a semi-adult, yes. I mean, yes. there was flirtation <laughs> with Tom yes. Selleck, maybe. Yeah. But nothing like Bruce Boxleitner. Adrian Barbeau in mine oh, was mine. Yeah. There was something about her that struck me. I know a the something. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Bruce Boxleitner, Scarecrow, Mrs. King, and Tron all at the same time. Wow. It was just love at first sight for me. When we moved from California to Virginia, I kept seeing some of the outside shots from Scarecrow and Mrs. King and I was obsessed even though they filmed it in California there were some you know establishing shots in Virginia but anyway I was obsessed with him in high school and to see him in something else is awesome so yeah seeing him and his scratchy voice <laughs> I dug that I wondered if he was going to take over the opening and he does. He he does the voiceover in the opening. Mm -hmm. And I also appreciated the fact that he's almost like the polar, being the same as Sinclair, but also the polar opposite. He doesn't have that connection with the Mimbari. He is actually, he destroyed one of their main ships. And so they, they have a, quite a different relationship. And that's going to, I think that's going to play out a little differently than we saw with Sinclair. So... Yeah, I, I love that he came on the show. He looks so young. Right? Just, and he <laughs> looks so full of energy. Yeah. So, Lou, before we get to the episode, thoughts on, do you have any history with Booth Boxleiter? Not to the extent that Karen does. I, I was familiar with the actor, and he was never a celebrity crush for me. That would have been Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched. Oh, wife, yeah. She was hot. Like that. But I knew that, from seeing him in the few episodes I watched of Scarecrow and King, uh, that I I knew that he was, in my mind, a, a more dynamic actor than than Michael O'Hare. So I thought that was going to be interesting. I In my mind, as I usually do, I always make Star Trek equivalents. It's the difference between Jeffrey Hunter as Christopher Pike and William Shatner as Captain James T. Kirk. And I think that mm -hmm. really played pretty close to my initial impressions in this first episode. Yeah, I can remember when I was watching this on TNT, you finish one episode the next day, and it was on during the afternoon, so I had to VHS it <laughs> mm -hmm. and then and then just rewind the tape and watch it. And I remember like, wait, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. And felt very different. I had no... I recognized the face, but I was not a regular watcher of Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Just was, this is a little bit different. And I was struck. He's a very different captain 
Mm -hmm. different lead. So I was happy to, oh, where's the show going to go? So a lot of blank is going down. Mm -hmm. In fact, Susan says, I'm paying off karma at an accelerated rate. Yep. She's pretty happy. It's only been a few days since the last episode. Everyone is still whirling after the president's assassination. So give me your quick thoughts, and we'll start with you, Lou, on the episode overall. Well, this is definitely a textbook case of in media ray, uh, jumping right into the middle of the action. Uh, I love the opening scene with uh, Susan and all those delegates that were hounding her. She sort of made her way to the CNC and then she basically lined them up just before she entered and <laughs> talked them all down. I, I thought that was just fantastic. And find out pretty quickly that the season is going to be quite different, which was already apparent from the opening credits, which just seemed a little more tighter and polished and a little more dynamic. And that was the, the overall impression that carried forward into the episode opening, the cold open, that things were really hopping and popping and they were not coddling you. If you hadn't watched the, the at least the last couple of episodes of the first season, you would, would probably be lost at the start of this one. Yeah, it's definitely a, an arc-based show, which I like. And we are not at the end of an arc. We're on that downward slide there but we're not quite at the end of it yet because we still have the open threads of garibaldi being injured and being in a coma we have sinclair has left but there's still some nebulousness about that he's on minbar we have a new guy coming in and the tension with the minbari and we have delenn who is still in her chrysalis and you know not not knowing the outcome of that. So there's quite a bit of stuff that's still in upheaval during this episode. And I liked that, not only because Bruce Boxleitner is handsome, but he's more of a, he, he's more military centric, where Sinclair, I think, had a little bit more of a spiritual philosophy. His there was that, background. So, yeah. 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 And there was the part of him that was a pilot, a fighter pilot. But right. there was also all this where he, he thought about things in a different way as, yes. a, as a military man. And I think that our new John Sheridan is going to be maybe less introspective, which I think makes things very interesting. Because when you have a hard ass like that, as your captain that had toes a line, they they're usually really like able to adapt to situations quicker. They don't have to think things through a million ways. So the and they they show that in this episode that he knew what to do with the men bar that that came through the portal because of all this experience he's had in the military. He didn't have to think about well, what are the philosophical implications of attacking this ship? It was just, we can't attack the ship because we know what's going on. So I really like that dichotomy. We we see that this is a new, we have a new playbook. And I really like that. I think he and Ivanova, I'm sorry, I can never say that right. He and Susan are going to play off each other a little differently. And I think Susan's going to appreciate having someone that is more like her as her captain. Not that she didn't like Sinclair, but, and you know, in this, I, I feel for her in this episode. She's now suddenly in charge. She also doesn't have this security force that's cohesive because Garibaldi is shot. She has a new captain. She has all these people asking things of her that aren't in her wheelhouse. She is not a diplomat. So I really felt for her in this episode, and I dig where this is going a lot. Yeah, the opening monologue, I just pulled it up. The Babylon Project was our last best hope for peace. A self-contained world five miles long, located in neutral territory, a place of commerce and diplomacy for a quarter of a million humans and aliens. A shining beacon in space, all alone in the night. It was the dawn of the third age of mankind. The year the Great War came upon us all. This is the story of the last of the Babylon stations. The year is 2259. The name of the place is Babylon 5. Nice. It is a really cool beginning. It is. Yeah, I remember thinking Bruce Boxleiter, John Sheridan, more of a traditional leading man. 
mm-hmm. has that good looks. He seems to be, I have in my career multiple times taken over for an existing team. And I thought his little opening beginning where telling the story, you will be better when you know, you'll be even better when you understand what you don't understand. Mm -hmm. He seemed very humble. He seemed very, hey, like he and Susan, I think was a nice touch that they have served together before. And so she respects him. And he says a couple of times, it's never, you've never been hesitant to tell me what you really think before. And I'm really going to be counting on you. So I think right away, it's a very good thought that he has at least one person on his side that I'm sure she misses Commander Sinclair, but she knows him, she respects him, and she is a good officer. She is going to support the whoever is in charge, but I think it's even more she's happy that it's someone she respects and likes. Yeah. So I think that was a very smart move for them to do. So Garibaldi's still in critical condition. Ambassador Lynn is still in the cocoon. Sinclair is off the station. He's now Earth Ambassador to Mambari. Great Council seems to be unhappy with Delenn. Jakar's not there. Kosh is still a mystery. And nothing is the same, as Sinclair said the last time. Lou, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with uh, the Mambari storyline? Sure, we can do that. It okay. is. It was a little confusing for me be- at first because the main Minbari that was talking besides Linear, I I didn't know who he was. Okay. And to be honest, I still don't really know who he was. I th- was he part of the Great Council? Or? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah, but he wasn't the one that she had the final conversation with, right? I yeah. think he was. I wouldn't mm. swear to it, but I think so. I'd have to look when she goes back and turns down. Yeah, I lead. think he's that, the one that okay. says, I, I believe that is, I believe that is him, but I am not, I, I will um, do some checking while you're talking. Okay, because I was confused who he was, and if he was on the Great Council, I was wondering why was he on Babylon 5? <laughs> but that, that, that was my main question, because I thought, yeah. that, is that the guy from the Great Council? What's he doing on the space station? So that threw me off. The, the situation with the rogue Minbari, who I'm not sure, was that was that Kalan or was that Hedron? I, I'm not sure if I got that backwards. Uh, that was No, that was Kalan. Yeah, so he he was not happy with the Grey Council. He felt that they had betrayed them by asking for, or, or standing down and entering into peace talks with the humans. So he had that rogue Minbari warship, the Trigadi. And so that he showed up when Dolin has gone into this chrysalis is interesting. And he had that confrontation with the other member of the Great Council. Uh, here it says Hedron. So I'm Hedron, now yeah. So now I'm getting really confused as to who. Kalein. Who, who's Kalein? Kalein was the, oh, Kalein is the rogue Minbar. Right. Yes, he Hedron, is the rank, yes. And Hedron, Hedron is, is the taller. Right. So, so they have their discussion and we find out that there's this, rogue element within Minbar society, which is, <laughs> are we going to go mm-hmm. there? I'm going to go there. It's people that are not accepting the election results from the 2020 yep. election. Yep. So it, it's, uh, yes, we just talked about the last episode. Sometimes <laughs> there's no way we can do it. That yeah. is the perfect, that is the perfect thing. Yes, they are. And we find out why. Mm-hmm. And so we can talk about Minbar, They They talk about in this little scene, Mimbari do not kill Mimbari. Right. And we find out the big reveal is that when they pulled Sheridan and somehow Delenn knew to pick him, get a feeling when they torture him and interrogate him. But when they end up scanning, they find that he has at least partially a Mimbari soul. And as they test other humans, other humans have Mimbari souls. So... Their number one creed is Membari do not kill other Membari. That is the ultimate. And so they're like, holy moly, we've got to stop. We are destroying. And Delenn talks about, or no, Lanier talks about that each generation there were fewer Membari. And that could be because they were killing humans which have Membari souls, so therefore they can't be reincarnated. So there is mention of 
Mumbari, do not kill Mumbari. And it comes back to say, oh my goodness, we have really effed up. We have to stop. So right. go ahead, continue. Well, that was a bombshell revelation. Mm -hmm. And it was a little interesting that Lanier was the one that was delivering this. I would have expected like a higher level great council. And I'm surprised that they delegated such a item to a lower official like Lanier. And the fact that he told Sheridan mm -hmm. and Susan was present. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, And it, so there's the delivery of it. And then there's this this whole concept that Minbari souls are in humans. I'm wondering if that is, I don't totally buy that explanation. And I think on further reflection since watching that episode, my gut instinct is that all souls are the same, regardless of race. So I would be curious if the Minbari would test a do a similar test on a Centuri or a if they tested the Anarn and a Centuri and found out the same thing that they all seem to have Minbari souls. So, and it also raises the question: Well, before Minbari met humans, how were they were they getting human souls even way back when before these two races even met each other? So there's a whole bunch of questions around it. I I think the idea is fascinating. I'm not totally I'm not buying the current explanation that we've been given i think it's bigger than that and we'll have to see where that goes but it offers up interesting thoughts for sure because it's basically stopping a war based on a idea rather than a tangible phys uh, physical measurable objective and that's always something that's really hard to sell like tall like like now that like we still can't get together on climate change and you know, the fact that we need to try to change our use of energy to correct the situation, reduce our carbon footprint and all that. That's all, it's all tangible, right? intangible, airy, fairy stuff, even though if you go by what we've seen just within the last couple of months with the weather, uh, like in the States and, yeah. and other countries, and the tangible evidence seems to be getting stronger and stronger. And maybe for the Minbari, the fact that there's less of them is there. They're tangible measures. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting concept. I don't totally buy the current explanation, and I think it's going to morph into something bigger later on. All right, Karen, thoughts? Yeah, and I think they dropped a lot of breadcrumbs that, to me, I was like, okay, seriously, why did I not catch that? <laughs> Galen has a very close relationship with these souls, as we saw in another episode where she was drawing them into herself, the rogue souls that the the soul taker was keeping the soul hunter yeah where she was breaking those souls yes right because, yeah. and making sure that they went somewhere true to mm -hmm. what the mimbari feel yeah the fact that they had this interest in sinclair this deep interest in him and that they stopped they halted the war completely now one of the questions i have is during the war there were mimbari that were killed and then humans were nearby. Is that when they went or were they reincarnated? I mean, there's lots of different things that that I think about here. Did the souls, I mean, the souls leave the Minbari. Do they just float around until they find someone? I mean, there's lots of things in my head. Right. Because we've seen they're like little, little balls. Yeah. That we might not see, but did, I mean, did they switch? Did, were there not enough Mimbari to to carry them? So, yeah, I. it makes me wonder if the Mimbari were in an area with a lot of humans. The humans outnumbered the Mimbari because of whatever scuffle had gone on. And then all of a sudden they transferred. And we know that Sinclair was part of the front line. So he was... And, and he survived, which means that he probably did a lot of damage to the Minbari, which means he was around where the humans outnumbered the Minbari. I mean, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Okay. And I, I think to weave together a couple of things that, so the Great Council, and we assume that the three members of the religious cast especially pushed like, oh my goodness, we are killing other Membaris right. and humans. We have to stop. And I'm sure the warrior cast is, look, don't give me your gooby-gobby, <laughs> you 
your stupid religious doctrine. This is a this is an enemy. They killed Dukat, and we need to burn them to the ground. Right. And so they must have convinced enough of the of the human the worker caste to make it over to we're going to stop this. Yeah. And so I think this is a beautiful way of this is why it happened, but this is also why a lot of Membari are not happy with the way they ended. Mm-hmm. You, right. We we had the superior forces. We were going to exterminate them. We they would no more be humans, and we ended up having to surrender when we were winning. Right. And they don't understand that because they weren't told. Right. right. And yeah. even the people on the Greg Council that were told probably don't believe it. Right. And you sure they're not. And I go back to, I apologize if this offends anyone, but there was the outtakes that the January 6th hearing had of showing President Trump trying to do a speech to like, hey, calm things down. And well, I don't want to say the we lost the election. Right. He wouldn't admit even he then. He wouldn't admit it. So you could see probably Mumbori warrior cast leaders from the Great Council. Well, we had to. I can't tell you why, but we really shouldn't have. Right. Because then it would be cut and dry and we don't yeah. want it to be cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah. And Hedron was the warrior cast, right? right? Okay. Yeah. And so, by the way, the actor who is on Babylon 5, if you go to IMDb, he is the ones that were on the previous episodes we've seen before. He was the one that was talking to Delenn, and so he's here this. So when John says, I know he's great counsel, which also confuses me a little bit, but how often, like, how much is the great counsel known in just regular day to day or is it because john was so active in the military and was involved in the greater he has the ear of the president and other leaders joint chiefs of staff is that why he knows wow he was in he was in castle yeah he was in torchwood yeah spongebob there you go <laughs> hey there's a, there's the holy Trinity. and he did a lot of game yeah he did a lot of game voiceovers yeah buffy galaxy quest yeah awesome so you talked about in our last episode, why did Delenn have to do the go into the cocoon when she did? And the Great Council seems unhappy. They're like, why didn't she wait for us? Right. And so I wonder if the reason why, and this is just speculation on my part, the reason she did it so quickly is because she was worried someone from the gay council, the great gay council, gray <laughs> council would show up. That's a whole other show. Her. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That they would stop her. But I do like that when Sheridan and Susan show up with the security force, they stop the Mumbari warrior and John tries to walk in and Delenn, the ambassador is indisposed right now. Come back later, much later. <laughs> like him trying to be, one of my nitpicks is he tells him that and then like the next scene almost, well, I was rude. I need to tell you something. You would seem like he would have at that moment go, well, we, now's not a good time, but I do need to spend time with you. So I'm assuming that the Great Council wants nothing to do with Sheridan because you see later when they're visiting, he is just dripping disdain that he has to even be in the room with Starkiller. So maybe that's why they had Lanier tell him the story. I, that's yeah. just speculation on my part. Yeah, it's, it still doesn't sit well for me that they okay. r- revealed this information at this particular point. I, I don't understand. It's not clear to me why they Minbari would reveal this now. Like withholding this information does is not going to change anything that's happening in this episode. So I, I'm the only reason I I see that they reveal this is so that the audience knows this. <laughs> yeah, other than I that, think, yeah. I other think than that, that, yeah. And I do know that one of the things that JMS says is I try to pay off all the mysteries within a season. Like Mm -hmm. if we put a mystery out by the end of the next season, we have revealed that. So this is a pretty big reveal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is very clearly, if you watch in the beginning, the movie that Charles talked about, this is made clear from the very beginning 
in that movie, this is revealed. So that's why a lot of people suggest that you not watch the movie first, because since I had seen the movie first, this was not shocking to me, but I knew it was the first time the characters had learned that important right. reason. Right. Yeah. So it's chronologically before all this, but Kinda for so, us, yes. we shouldn't watch exactly. it because yes. this should be the reveal. Yes. Right. So we it looked almost like the Lynn was crying or was that just or was that just goose or ooze I don't know but as we end the episode she's still in the cocoon mm -hmm. so I do not remember how quickly a reveal happens if you have watched if you've ever watched scenes of the later episodes or if you look at the season 2 box Shocker, you know that she comes out looking different. Mm -hmm. So that will be, I, I can't wait to talk that up with you guys. Right. Which um, is not surprising that she's, yeah. but we just don't know how different. You know, yes, exactly. Yeah. Look, you know. The, the other thing I, after spending the season with John, do you like him as a character? I remember there was criticism after the fact that he seemed too light. Like he's talking about fresh oranges. He's happy about a shower. And, but I, like you, Susan, uh, Karen, I don't know why all of a sudden I was thinking <laughs> Susan, which I did a few. That's all right. I'll ago. take it. Yeah. He was, he's smart. He could think ahead. He looked at that. There's only honor and death left. And he was able to figure that out. So after one episode, our thoughts on our new captain going back again. Yeah. You know, Lou said, that it's like the difference between Pike and Kirk. And I think that's yeah. a really great comparison because yeah. we know that Kirk was a great strategist. He yeah. solved the Maru. Blah, 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 Maru. Yeah. Kobayashi, what? Maru. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and that was an unsolvable, unwinnable situation. Right. She um, cheated, but yeah. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, but that's what you had to do to win, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah got a commendation for original thinking. Yep. Right. Exactly. Um, and I feel like that Sheridan's going to be that kind of captain, that his mind works in a way that he strategizes two steps ahead. I wouldn't say 10 steps ahead because it took him a, a little while. I mean, what's his face killed himself before he could figure it out. Kalein. Mm -hmm. Kalein killed himself before he could figure it out. So he's struggling to catch up a little bit, but he's also thinking ahead. So I feel like he he has a foot in both sides where he has the strategic mind and he's still pedaling to catch up. He he just got there and all this stuff is happening. And I don't think it's a huge coincidence. I think that Maybe Kalane came on board knowing that Sheridan was going to be there. And Sheridan, being the star killer, having decimated this big ship, that maybe he would do it again. And that's his goal. He wants to be a martyr for the cause. Yes. So, you know, I don't think that Sinclair would have done that. Sinclair would have tried to find another way. He wouldn't have attacked the ship at all. But they do have a better chance now with Sheridan. So, yeah, I, I think that was very strategic. And it just all happened to come together with the Great Council and Delenn going into the cocoon and all that stuff. That That's when Colleen seized upon the opportunity to, to try and either die with honor or start the war up again. Yeah, so your thoughts on that, Lou, that the idea there, I do think the idea that Starkiller by the way, John is saying, look, I I just, I put a bomb on an asteroid. I I was able to destroy them. And he is like, we, we're in, we're in a war. And mm -hmm. I'm proud that we were able to do this because that's what the job is. It, in war, your idea is you're supposed to kill your enemy. So they feel like he did it with trickery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think back, I think JMS mentioned the Revolutionary War where the British were all marching in order in, in line and the Americans were like, he's standing behind trees and things shooting. So 
I think they wanted that. They wanted him to kill them so that if they couldn't restart the war, at least they would have a honorable death. And he figured out that it wasn't their block and the Mambari had to do it. And I love the ending where he tells the Mambari captain, thank you for your help. And they're like, this is not a good day for us. And yeah. I wanted mm-hmm. to go, he doesn't think it is either. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't start this. So I do not think they're happy that he, I did love the scene where he says, well, the president thinks you guys have been too much in our business, mm-hmm. you know? And so we're going to run our station the way we want. So any thoughts about this the Bombari storyline and them ending with them having to destroy their own ship. Technically they didn't, the ship blew themselves up. So they didn't break Bombari. Does not kill other Bombaris? But wouldn't suicide be bad? Bombari and killing Bombari. So a little bit of shadiness there. Mm -hmm. Thoughts guys. Well, to answer your your Sinclair question, I, I think the episode was really tailored to show his strengths and at the same time deftly incorporate all these overarching series threads that we're we're uh, looking forward to exploring. Yeah. So from that perspective, the things like with the orange and the shower and all that stuff, I, I bought that. He was on a he was out on the on the rim. He said so. That worked for me. I chuckled when they his nickname was Star Killer because that was the original name for Luke Skywalker. So mm-hmm. I thought oh, that was okay. I thought that was a nice little nod. I do like how he was able to use his military experience to see through the subterfuge of the Trigadi sending in the, the fleet of fighters. I thought that was well done. I do agree with you though that him being able to make that logic leap about the Grey Council or linking the Grey Council to that. I thought that was pushing it over the edge a little bit too much, uh, making him seem a little too capable. But in the overall scheme of things, I th- I thought that was it was that was the gimme of the episode that I was willing to yeah. to let go by. So that was fine. And then tying it up at the end with the Minbari disabling the ship, and that is interesting because, as you said, they're against killing each other. But so to me, that would mean that suicide is an unthinkable thing to them. Like to do a mass destruct like that. Uh, so that that doesn't quite ring true for me, but uh, yeah. and I don't know why they would but I guess there's maybe that was just maybe it meant to illustrate how disillusioned that the crew of that ship were with the rest of their Minbari con- counterparts. I don't know. I'm just yeah, thinking out loud about that. And the thing that I, I I particularly like about this episode is that with the introduction of Sheridan and and the, his relationship with the Minbari is that where Sinclair was shown as being sympathetic to their their plight, we have a, a new commander in Sheridan who is totally opposed to them because of his experiences with them in the war. And the Minbari are totally not happy with him being in charge of the, of the station as well. And I think it reflects the power shift for, on Earth with the new president as well. So even though he's coming in as a very capable character he's also being manipulated by other forces and it'll be interesting to see if he twigs to that fact down the line and realizes what what is going on and i hope i'm hoping that like we're seeing again in real world with many judges who are appointed uh, through republican promotions that they are following the letter of the law and not ruling in favor of politics as opposed to the the letter of the law and i'm hoping that this is the kind of journey that sinclair is going to or sheridan's going to go on as well i i like that i like that a lot how about you karen yeah i mean i have similar thoughts my hand wave is that that was the end of the line for that ship Mm -hmm. that they had no other options and so that's what they decided to do i mean their plan was for the earthers to kill them and they thought that was the end that was going to happen and so when that didn't happen the the only thing they could do is is self-destruct they were done they were tired that you know they were hiding from everyone they were these rebels that were trying to get by and i think this was their last ditch effort to go out on a good note and i think they just wanted to go out yeah that was my hand wave at least Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's... Which raises a big question to me is why didn't the Great Council 
knowing this situation and with this particular ship, why wouldn't they tell them the truth and see how they reacted to it? Right. So, yeah, there's some blame to go around there as well. Again, hand wave, hand wave. Yeah. Well, and I do think that it could be they're just a shame because the Mumbari are so they're elitist. They think they're better than everyone else. And just think that they are somehow related mm. to the lowly humans mm -hmm. might just be something they don't want to share. I also think the great council to me a little bit seems to be, I mean, they spend all their time in a spaceship. They're not among the common people. They don't go to go back to the cliche. I bet they do not know what a gallon of milk costs. Right. <laughs> You know, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When they when they were first talking, uh, when when Sheridan was first talking to, uh, was it Haig, General Haig, who, yeah, great guest star, Robert Foxworth, yes. who mm -hmm. played Questar in the Questar tapes, and I'm always disappointed yeah. that that movie never went to series. But yeah, yeah, when they first started talking about that Membari worship, I thought it was the Great Council worship that they were talking about, mm -hmm. and not the Turgati. Yeah. So that was mm -hmm. that was interesting as well. So we also got a new character. I, he didn't have a lot to do this episode. Warren Kiefer. I don't know the story behind this. I, I, If I read it, I won't. But it gets the feeling like, hey, let's give someone that's not in the command structure. Maybe we can tell some different stories of someone who's a fighter pilot. I almost think a little bit of like, oh, we need someone for the young people. Let's bring in Walter Kane right? In the original S Star Trek. I honestly will tell you, I was not impressed with him when I first saw him. Rewatching, I certainly, I'm sure he is a fine man in real life, <laughs> but the character, I just did nothing for me. How about you, Lou? Any thoughts on our new fighter pilot? Yeah, I just took him to be as a conduit for the for the pilots, for the fighter contingent okay. of, of, this, of the uh, cast, because basically they've been red shirts nameless interchangeable yeah. characters so now they're trying to put a face on that particular category of crew on on the babylon 5 and i'm only assuming that they've done this because these x-wings or whatever they are are, are going to yeah. play bigger parts in episodes down the line because tensions are rising so there's going to be more standoffs between them and other aliens vessels and whatnot so i just thought they were trying to put a face on it and something that works well with Battlestar Galactica, even though I think the remake came after this series, but the original Battlestar Galactica was has, was out at this time mm -hmm. as well. And maybe they just wanted to tap into that X-Wing, Luke Skywalker, Biggs dynamic a little bit too. So it's I think it was just a conduit. But like you, I it was weird to see him featured so much in non-pilot scenes as well. So, But yeah. I just figured, well, okay, we'll just see where this goes. But for now, yeah, he doesn't really make much of a, a mark for me. I I actually enjoyed it. Good. I think that it's good to see that they have a defense force on Babylon 5. And I think this guy was very pilot-like. He was like a cross between Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. Okay. For me, at least. And it's not that he was he stood out or anything. It's just that I think it was nice to see there is a different part of the military on Babylon 5. It's not just I'm in charge and then there's this whole like all diplomats and, and shopkeepers and stuff. There's actually a defense force fighter pilots on board and we get to see how they live. They get letters from home, which is like a hologram or whatever. Yeah. They are bored because nothing ever happens that they have to deploy for. Unless it's just we're following the captain down to a planet or whatever. Right. So I, I liked it. I can see where you wouldn't dig it, but I think it was okay. Good. Robert Rustler is his name. And oh, I have good. to say, you mentioned Robert Foxworth, who played Haig. I like him as well. I think he's a really good actor. So it was nice seeing too. him mm -hmm. on the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's and, been uh, in a million the, things. Yeah. Yeah. And the behind the scenes, JMS said that if Boxlider had not been available, he was their second choice oh, awesome. for John Sheridan. That yeah. would have worked too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he did. We also got a new set that we will see this season. Oh yes. Earhart's mm -hmm. Amelia's. I can't remember if it's but it is a it is a like a non-commissioned officer's lounge 
yeah. Ant Lounge. It is for just the people on Earth Force. And it is set in a 40s motif, and they play big band music. <laughs> so we'll see that. So did it remind you of The Good Place, where where she's tortured by having to listen to jazz? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> it kind of reminded me of that. Good, yeah. All right, so uh, any other thoughts about the episode? Well, we haven't addressed it yet, but the, the sudden departure of Sinclair was a bit jarring, to say the least. Yes, so that's exactly where I wanted to go next. I remember being really surprised that our lead mm -hmm. was no longer there. There was a lot of discussion about that. One of our listeners, Cheryl, sent a very lovely email asking, were we aware of the situation of why Michael O'Hara left? And I had read this, and so I held off the story. She sent this at the end of August. I held off sending the email to this. Basically, that... Michael O'Hara was having issues. He was fighting depression. He was suffering from paranoid delusions and hallucination. And JMS offered to suspend filming while he got treatment. O'Hara was concerned that the treatment would make too long and would kill the series, costing other people jobs. They reached an agreement that O'Hara would finish out the season to be written out in a way that would allow further return appearances. O'Hara was concerned about the damage to his career. Because even to this day, mental illness is, has a stigma to it. Stravinsky offered to keep the secret to his grave. And O'Hara countered, well, why not keep it to my grave? He says, after I pass, if you are still alive, please share the story to, where, to raise awareness regarding mental health. And he also felt that it was fair for fans to reach an explanation. JMS kept his word. He never talked about. There was all this debate and discussion about, well, you wanted to get rid of him because he was a bad actor, or you wanted to increase ratings because Bruce Boxletter is a better name, or you've written yourself in a corner and so you needed something else, and JMS just all took it well and just kept it on. And then after O'Hara died, he showed the story. So thank you, Cheryl, for sharing that. I was aware of it. I sent it to Lou and Karen. So we talked a little bit before we hit record, but your thoughts on that reveal, and we'll start with you, Lou. Well, it it's interesting because I thought that it was his departure was due to maybe a scheduling conflict that he had another like a maybe a movie offer or something that he he wanted to pursue or who knows even maybe a play. Never in my mind suspecting that it was due to some mental issues or anything like that. So I hope in retrospect, I haven't gone back over listening to our podcast because after I've done editing them, I'm pretty well done listening to them. So sure, I, absolutely. I, I yeah. can't remember how we were in general. I think we were generally pretty fair handed in our evaluation of his acting ability. I might have tempered my comments a bit more if I had known beforehand going into this season that he was under this type of stress. And it's good that JMS was able to honor his wishes and it's it's too bad that at that time period and even today that mental issues are of a delicate subject to handle and to deal with and I'm in retrospect it it's really hard now to think of the episodes where I thought maybe he was a bit flat without thinking that well maybe he was really struggling that day as well so it's just another incidents of you can't judge a person on a, a specific moment in their life without knowing the context of which you're operating under all these other factors that you're not aware of. So you have to be, sometimes we're a little too quick to judge things and it, sometimes it's, it's better to take a step back. And in this particular case, it's, I'm impressed that I don't know how severe, it sounded like it was pretty, a pretty difficult time for him. But yeah. the fact that he had the commitment to finish the season speaks volumes to me that even though he was struggling with these issues, that he was still able to complete the, the season so that all these other... And he was he was concerned for the other people in the, in the crew losing their jobs and whatnot. So, you know, that shows that he's a caring individual. And it I guess the only thing that I don't know behind the scenes again, what JMS said to the rest of the cast, because it sounded like there was conflicts with the cast during the filming of the season. So I, I don't know how many of these actors knew that O'Hare was uh, undergoing this stress. And 
what they thought of him. And unfortunately, some of those actors had passed away before him. So they might have gone to the graves thinking that this guy was yeah. a, a jerk without knowing the whole story. So it's, yeah, it's this it's overing revelation for me. And I I feel a little bit chagrined that I may, and at some time during the season, been a little too hard on him without knowing this. So I'm very, am, I really like how JMS and O'Hare have handled this situation. And the only wish I would have had is that the other cast members and crew had been made aware of the situation before any of them are no longer in the picture as well. Yeah, well said. I think I want to hear your thoughts, Karen, but I was thinking of Simone Biles, right? Mm. That people are like, oh, come on, it's the Olympics. It's every four years. Suck it up. And mm -hmm. you would never say that about, oh, you have a broken leg. Just rub some dirt on it and go right. ski. Or it is broken leg, broken arm. Go get into the basketball court. And it's just very sad. Karen, how about you? Yeah, mental health is something that really needs less stigma. It's, like you said, it's just like having a broken leg or a broken arm. It's it's not something you can control. And it shouldn't be something to be ashamed of. It's something you should go see a doctor about and get treated, just like any other illness. And I do appreciate that he thought about that. That Michael O'Hare thought, well, when you do reveal it, maybe it'll lessen some stigma. And just don't want it revealed now because, you know, I'm still around and it might affect things and it might affect how people look at me. And I felt for him mm -hmm. reading that email. I was very sympathetic to him. And yeah, we did say he was wooden, but, you know, it doesn't negate the fact that he was wooden. Right. There were times when he was wooden. So, I mean, I feel a little bad that we ranked on him, but on one hand, he actually was that way. And if there was an underlying reason for it, yeah, that is regrettable. But I'm going to say that he's wooden if he's wooden. You know what I yeah, mean? And so I just interviewed a, a writer and he did a book. He has a new book out and I'm think of his name in a minute. Sometimes when you're old, you don't remember. Yeah. Jeff Perlman. And he had written, a, he has a new book out on Bo Jackson. He's written a Walter Payton, but he wrote a book about the Dallas Cowboys, the early 90s Cowboys. And in it, he is pretty hard on Charles Haley because Charles Haley loved walking around pantsless, showing off his member <laughs> and putting it in people's faces and putting it on your shoulder. And you turn... Oh, yeah, yeah. well, gross. it turned out Charles Haley was bipolar and is now getting help and is on medication. And Jeff said, if I'd known that, I may have been a little softer in writing about that. Right. Because softer, haha. Yeah, ha. I see what you did there. Did not mean <laughs> to. He said, you know, I wouldn't make fun of someone who had only one arm. Okay, but it's still gross. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, exactly. But there, and I think the same thing, right? We can say we talked about how well he did in some episodes mm -hmm. where he talked yeah. about he really hit it out of the park. I loved him in this episode. Then we others we could see where he didn't. So the more I read, and I have read JMS's autobiography, I've read there is a whole collection of books where he talks about every where you can buy the total scripts and he gives a complete introduction of the scripts he is very active on social media that i think he's a good guy yeah and i think he's trying to do his best mm -hmm. and i think that it is good that i will tell you not spoilers that o'hare is able to come back okay mm -hmm. and appear in future episodes and i think that was very it would be hard not to say, look, guys, you got it totally wrong. Let me tell you what really was happening. Sure. But he did, and he said, so I I'm very glad that we were able to share this and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you again so much for the email reminding us. And we'll go forward and rest in peace, Mr. O'Hare. So what was the general reaction from the fans of the time when this happened? Like, what was, did they just think that they didn't get along or that he, th they wanted a better actor or like what was a. 
Yeah, I, I think, think all so of the too. above. I think there was a lot yeah. of speculation, okay. and JMS just didn't confirm or deny anything. Mm. I think that's what yeah. I read at the time. And I also read that he was very close to Bill Mummy and Mira, Fur Mira mm -hmm. Furlan. And I'm thinking that maybe they knew, mm -hmm. but I don't know whether anyone else did. And it, it does break my heart that maybe some people thought he was a dick. Yeah. <laughs> that he was just a dick. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, it makes me sad. Yeah. It really does that someone had to struggle with that. Yeah. That's so in the public eye at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't like it wasn't he did not like I said he waited till he was dead that it happened and in 2013 and on then mm. you know in 2012 is when he died. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, he had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm. do you remember what was the reaction then from the fandom? Like they're going, "Oh my god," or yeah, I think so. I think one of the things is Babylon 5 has lost a higher than normal amount of characters. Okay. Considering yeah, how young they, they were. Hmm. I mean, if you look at Michael O'Hara is gone, Jerry Dole is gone, Mira Farrell is gone, Richard Big is gone, Stephen First is gone, mm -hmm. Andrea Kasulis is gone. Mm -hmm. So that's Jakar. Veer, Dr. Franklin, Delenn, Michael Garibaldi, and Commander Sinclair have all passed. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Makes me sad. It really does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And and it, just turning yeah. it back to the show, then I'm curious to see how what the relationship between Garibaldi and Sheridan is going to be because I I don't know. Yes. I I assume Sheridan's going to be just as accommodating as Sinclair was. I wish they didn't have such similar last names. That's confusing. I know. <laughs> well, that's that's partly... By design? <laughs> JS, J, yeah. JMS, oh, okay. JMS, JMS, oh, okay. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and as we get... It is pretty well known that Michael J. Michael Stravinsky said he, he had a plan for the whole five-year arc. Mm-hmm. But he had trap doors that if he lost any character. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to, because he lost Commander Sinclair, he was able to do something with John Sheridan that he was able to rewrite a few things mm -hmm. to give the story a different. And I think if you, at the end of the five seasons, you might say, wow. If everything that happened to both Sinclair and Sheridan had happened to one character, right? Man, that's a lot. Yeah. So by having this, yeah, you're sure. able to yeah. do a little bit different without okay. being spoilery. I was really upset in real life when Stephen first died. For some reason, he was the one that. Yes. I don't yes. know, because mostly because of yes. Animal mm -hmm. House, but yeah, it was sad. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yes, I was. I know that Richard Biggs was one of the first and everyone was very crushed. And there is the funny story of when Andreas was dying and mm -hmm. he was a big smoker. So he had lung cancer. And when he when he knew he was dying, they had a dinner, him and Michael, J. Michael Stravinsky. And he's like, okay, all the <laughs> secrets you didn't want to tell, all the things you didn't, mm -hmm. now's the time to tell because I'm taking it to my grave. Mm -hmm. And good for him. Wonderful celebration of life. And mm. yeah, so very nice. All right. Let's rate this one. We're we're on a new journey. Lou, you first. I'm gonna give this nine wandering souls. Okay. Karen. I give it eight and a half oranges. <laughs> ah, very nice. I am in the same trend. I'm going to give it nine out of ten plums. <laughs> the hot showers. The black but not, ones. But the not the red ones. Not yes. the red ones. That's yes. my preference as well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We had a plum tree in our backyard in oh, California. Nice. And man... Oh, man. Apples, plums. We had a lime tree and a lemon tree. Oh, so good. I did want to ask, that. did a few people online were unhappy that the CNC was was empty when Sharon did his mm. speech? Did, did that bother either of you? Not really. I think mm -mm. in 
in the context of the episode, because so much was going on, he never really had a moment where he could just look around and and take in the lay of the land by himself. And yeah. to me, that that's what that moment was. This is, yeah. hey, I, I'm really here now. This is where I'm going to be. Yeah. And so it's the people are important, but this is the place where a lot of the things that I'm going to do are going to happen. So even the christening of a ship or dedication mm -hmm. of a building or whatever I, I took it in the same way yeah yeah and it, yeah it's kind of also like lucky socks yeah that he has to give that speech mm -hmm. no matter what Five minutes to spare to the command right yeah <laughs> so the fact that he did that i like that he got that closure that he solidified his place yeah. on mm -hmm. the space station i'm good with him deliver i i think it's fun that he just had to do it it didn't matter who heard yeah. it yeah. i i I, I really it. like it for his character because throughout the episode we see that he's a very practical straightforward demanding man of action kind of guy but yet he still has these little superstitions that and that that yeah. makes for a more fuller character so i i, I, I really like yeah. that so yeah. i'm very happy because a couple of people complained why would the C and C be empty. That wouldn't that, there be that's twenty a hours a question. day, seven days a week. Yeah, that's a different and, question. <laughs> and their answer was that every thirty-six to forty hours they reboot the systems and just no one everything's automated or something. So and he JMS said that he had established that earlier. So that isn't just a that they, they had talked about that. So it didn't bother me till someone brought it's it up. It's a space station. It's not a ship. Right. I mean, it's in a static location. Yeah, so but, if they did have to reboot everything. But ships are coming in and out at all different times, right? So yeah, that's sure. kind of yeah. weird. It is kind of, it is weird that it, because it, it's yeah. like an airport doesn't, control tower doesn't go empty for, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. there's always somebody there. So from that perspective, I understood, I understand what they're saying. But yeah. from the character's perspective of making the speech to them, Rube, I thought it was yeah. a, actually a nice touch. I did too. Yeah. Maybe he waited for the one guy to go to the bathroom. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. So it says, <laughs> my thought at the time, and I probably should have put this in dialogue in retrospect, was that there's a window about every 36 hours where the entire CNC system goes through self-maintenance for about a half an hour, backing things up, doing self-repair, falling logs with their central, that sort of thing. They normally pick a slow period of docking, and any routine stuff is handled through the backup CNC and at the, the station access you which we see. don't know exists yeah. you can see <laughs> right, it directly right. above the decking name the normal so CC a, is below it i thought of it as wave. the back when i worked for a software company we would get complaints sometimes and i would have to exp explain to our clients that starting about two in the morning till four in the morning sometimes five all our servers are gone through a backup mm -hmm. right they are cycling through so if you're trying to log on at the time your server is being backed up. You won't be able to, but that is that is the most practical time for us to do a backup versus four in the afternoon. So yeah, good. All right. So we got it. We're done. Mm -hmm. We're on our second journey. You Any final thoughts before we tell people how to reach us? No, I'm just excited. It seems like, the, I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it just generally felt like this episode, maybe because they've, built all the, the established sets and that are already there. So now they have the budget to actually flesh out all the peripheral things. And it just felt a little more polished this time. And the acting across the board felt much more mm -hmm. consistent. Hopefully that will continue. I'm buoyed by the fact that they are getting guest stars like Robert Foxworth to mm -hmm. come in and do little yeah. bits. I hope that continues. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to see where it goes. And there's definitely Bruce Box Leitner brings a different energy level uh, or dynamics to this to this show that wasn't there in the first season karen yep i can't wait to be thirsty <laughs> yes in every episode yes watching bruce box Lightner. yeah i did have one nitpick that i forgotten to bring up the tech who told sheridan that oh my goodness something's happening she did seem a little like they had brought in someone like you had won a cameo yeah. in a costume right. you know, in a contest because she did not see, she she had kept it just a little too enthusiastic, like she was yelling her line. Yeah, that yeah, the the C and C staff yeah. are are they're just back on. Like even like when he said you know, captain on board, and they they're all standing at attention, but one guy's feet were pointing yeah. 
toes were out, right. not straight forward. I was going, that, that's not that's yeah. not a military exactly. standing at attention stance, but well, I thought, yeah, little, you know, whatever. But. A little side note, I know they did do that every once in a while because I listened to a morning show called Don and Mike in yeah. Virginia. Don Geronimo still going at it. I think Mike still has a show. But back in the day, they did some guest shots because their radio station was owned by whatever media was oh, connected okay. with this. And they did a walk on. And this is how they got their SAG cards because they snuck a line in. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. uh, this is how Mike, Mike O'Mara and Don Geronimo, his name is not Don Geronimo in real life, but okay. how they got their SAG cards by being on Babylon 5. And I'll bring it up when that episode Good. airs. Sounds so if funny. anyone knows Don and Mike, I mean, they're, they were syndicated and all that. So Good. on the same station as Howard Stern. Well, I am thrilled that we are starting the second season. I look forward to it. A little behind the scenes. We may be delayed getting a couple of episodes out. I've got family obligations for the next two weekends. So we won't be recording, but we will be back. I feel a little bit bad because if we rush to second episode, then you've got to wait two weeks before you watch episode three. But they are forgiving me. So they are. We kind. are. That's yes. Fine. For, for the listeners, this yeah. should be transparent because I've got three episodes okay. in the can. So I'll release one each week. So it'll oh, seem nice. like normal to them. But to us. Yeah, we'll miss you. Three, yeah, well, I miss you guys too. Yeah. All right, Lou, how yeah. can someone reach you if they need to? At Lou's Reviews on YouTube, where you can find the Babylon 5 podcast, the Stephen King podcast, our JKLM Media podcast, and we promise we will eventually get to Station 11. And I also have my writer's podcast on Twitter. You can find me at Lou W. Sitzba, where I post my Wordle yep, me too. scores every day, and at S. King Podcast. Nice. And Karen? Yeah, Wordle was a little frustrating today. I was upset that I didn't get it on the second guess. Because mm. my first guess gave me three greens. Me too. Same here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But then my second guess only gave me yes. two. <laughs> right. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Or was it? Uh, okay. I can't remember now, but I got it in four. So I'm I'm at Elveria on the Twitter machine, as I call it. I also say the TV box. So if you know, I'm weird like that. Alveria, A-L-E-V-E-R-I-A. Please follow me and you'll get the retweets of this podcast. We get some people who follow me that actually you know, say things in regards to the podcast. I try and retweet that. I talk about gaming. I talk about politics. I talk about cats sometimes. Ducks. Dogs. Today, a llama. Ducks, exactly. A llama. Eagles. I watch the Eagles cam. Anyway. That's me. Follow me. Go to my blog, all that stuff. Perfect. I am at Jesse Jackson DFW on Twitter. You can hear me talk about Bruce Springsteen and music on Set Lustig Bruce. You can hear me every other week with Charles Skaggs talking Doctor Who. We have October 23rd, as we're recording this, coming up, the final episode of Jodie Whittaker's Doctor. So excited about that. And I have a new podcast coming out soon. Perfectly good podcast, which is me and Sylvan Groth are going through every John Hyatt song from A to Z, mm -hmm. which is a the first time I've ever done that. So we're having fun and learning how to do that. The beauty is they're very short episodes, 15, 20 minutes, and we're done. <laughs> and I am not used to that. I'm used to an hour easy discussion. Yeah. So uh, it's nice. So, guys, stay safe. Thank you for keeping us company on this journey. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Lou. And we will talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. And see. Bye. Bye.